hear me without a microphone? Yes. yes. No. Thank you. It's a great pleasure and honor to be back at Moscow State University in the physics faculty. I visited here for about one month every other year from 1968 until the 1990s. And I have had great uh, discussions with scientists here. I have learned particularly from Vladimir Borisovich Virginsky's group. I have learned a large amount of physics, which has had a big impact on my career. So this is a very, very special place for me. I want to begin uh, my way of motivation by reminding you that if we have a black hole that spins, it drags inertial frames into motion, or it's more useful to say that it drags space into motion, in the sense that if you go down near the black hole, you cannot avoid being dragged around by the whirling space relative to distant stars. This, you can think of the black hole as creating a tornado in space, with the air whirling faster near the black hole or slowly farther away. And so, this motivates me to ask the question, what happens when two black holes orbit each other and spiral together and collide? Each black hole is like a tornado, creating a whirling of space around itself. So you have two tornadoes orbiting each other. The orbital angular momentum also drags space into motion. So you have two tornadoes inside a third larger tornado. You want to know what happens when these tornadoes come together and collide. Uh, when, when the motion is that of space and not of whirling air. In fact, what will happen is a, uh, a number of things. First of all, 10% of the mass of these black holes will be converted into gravitational radiation. By contrast, thermonuclear burning can only convert one part in 200 of the mass of uh, material into radiation. So this is 20 times more powerful than thermonuclear burning. Second, the luminosity in gravitational waves during the collision is about then 10% of the mass converted to energy by multiplying by the speed of light squared. It comes off at a time of about 100 gm over c cubed, where g is Newton's gravitation constant. So the total luminosity is about 10 to the minus 3 c squared over g, independent of the mass of the black hole. That's 10 to the 24 times the luminosity of the sun. That is 10,000 times the luminosity of all the stars in the universe put together. 10,000 universe luminosities during the collision. If the collision is two black holes of 10 solar masses, then the collision lasts for only a fraction of a second. The total energy that comes off is one solar mass because it's such a short time, despite the very high luminosity. If the black holes have masses of a billion solar masses, like the black holes in the centers of large galaxies, then the waves come off in a time of about one day, and the total uh, energy that comes off is 100 million, 10 to the 8 solar masses. But always the luminosity is 10 to the 4 times the luminosity of all the stars in the universe put together. There is no electromagnetic waves emitted at all except if the black holes are surrounded by a disk of hot gas, then this will disturb the disk and there will be electromagnetic waves from the disk, which will be very important for me later. <coughs> what really happens is the black holes as they collide with their whirling space 
they create the nonlinear dynamics of curved space time. And this is what I would like to understand. This is my motivation in this subject. The details of the collision, the details of the nonlinear dynamics of curved space time, are encoded in the waveforms of the gravitational waves. And so, my vision for this field is a vision that has driven me, been very important for me for the past 20 years, is to use black hole collisions as an arena, a place to explore nonlinear dynamics of curved space time with two tools. First, the observational tools of gravitational waves. Then, theoretically, we cannot solve Einstein's equations analytically for such a collision. The only way we can understand theoretically what happens is what, by numerical simulations. And so we have two new sets of tools, numerical simulations and gravitational wave observations. Together with Rainer Weiss and Ronald Draper, I created, I founded LIGO in 1983, uh, and it has had a very big impact, contribution from Boston State University. This is the gravitational wave side of things. By the year 2000, the LIGO team uh, on the theory side, data analysis side, was so strong that I was no longer needed. And so I have changed my personal direction to numerical simulations, and this is where my current research is numerical simulations to understand what happens in these collisions. The attempts to solve Einstein's general relativity equations on supercomputers, or compute clusters as they call them today, so-called numerical relativity, this, these attempts began in 1960, the same time approximately as gravitational wave detection efforts began. The two efforts have gone on in parallel. Big success in the simulations has only occurred in very recent years. But I will, in the first part of my lecture, I will describe that success. There are a large number of research groups around the world doing these simulations. But they simulate the group that I am connected with at Caltech, Cornell, and in Toronto, Canada, the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics, led by Saul Tukolsky at Cornell, uh, who's a former student of mine, who's now the Hans Theta professor at Cornell. This group uses different techniques than all the other groups. This group uses spectral methods, as they are called, whereas everybody else uses finite difference methods. I will not describe the, diff the difference between these methods, but I will only say that the spectral methods are much more difficult, and therefore they were slower to get working. But now that they are working, they are far faster and far more accurate than finite difference. Because as you uh, decrease your grid size, the uh, accuracy increases exponentially rapidly instead of as a power law, which means far more rapid convergence, far higher accuracy, far greater speed, <coughs> about an order of magnitude faster, about a factor 10 faster, a factor 10 more excellent. Now, in order to understand the results of these simulations, it was necessary to visualize the curvature of space and time. In the past, we have used methods that capture, that uh, visualize only small pieces of the curvature of space-time. But recently, the physical review letter, about one year ago, a group of young people in South Africa and Cornell and Caltech that I am tied to, has invented new ways to visualize, to see the curvature of space-time. I can all, so these, Pictures are taken from a video conference. We collaborate by video conference because we are spread between South Africa 
or an L in Caltech. Uh, and I will only remark that everybody in this team is one half or one third my age. And it is a great pleasure for me to collaborate with very young people who are very smart, who are smarter than I am. But I have more ancient wisdom to bring, so that's the only way I can contribute. I'm now going to say, have one slide that is somewhat technical. Uh, this is for people who know some relativity to explain the background for these ways to visualize space-time curvature. In physics, we normally split up space-time with its four dimensions into three-dimensional space plus one time dimension. When we do this, the four-dimensional electromagnetic field tensor splits into the electric field and the magnetic field. And we visualize these using magnetic field lines and electric field lines, such as the magnetic field lines around the Earth. So what my team and I have found is ways to visualize space-time curvature with field lines in a similar way. The Riemann curvature tensor in general relativity is the quantity that describes space-time curvature. But it also describes forces, and those forces are the tool by which that we use to uh, build field lines. So the space-time, space-time part of this Riemann tensor, again, this is technical for those who know relativity, is the so-called tidal gravitational field, which I will discuss. The uh, space, space, space time part, from it you construct a piece that we call the frame dragging field. This tidal field describes the tidal accelerations that, by which the moon raises tides on the Earth's oceans, for example. Or when an astronaut, when a cosmonaut falls into a black hole, this is the forces that stretch the cosmonaut uh, and squeeze the cosmonaut. If we have two free falling particles separated by a separation vector C, then the relative acceleration between the two, that's pushing them apart or together, is minus the contraction of this tidal field into the separation vector. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, and that is well known to people. Not so well known is this other part of the Riemann tensor, the so-called frame drag field. It describes differential frame dragging. If I have a gyroscope at this location, at the tip of the vector C, and I watch it recess using inertial frames at the tail of C, at this point location Q, the angular velocity of recession P as seen from Q is again, it's the contraction now of the frame drag field into the separation vector. These two fields, so that's why we call this the frame drag field, these two fields contain all of the information about the Riemann curvature tensor. Everything. And so if we can visualize these two fields, we see the entire space-time curvature in those visualizations. So I will now show you step by step how we do these visualizations. If I have a spinning black hole, a curved black hole, let me imagine hanging a person from uh, a wire or let this person fall into the black hole above the North Pole region. If this person looks at a gyroscope at her feet, using inertial frames of her head, because the black hole drags space into motion more rapidly at her feet than at her head, her head sees her feet precessing, the gyroscope of her feet precessing counterclockwise. If you think about it, when her feet look up at her head, her feet will also see her head, the gyroscope at her head, precess counterclockwise. Therefore, for the north pole of the black hole, there is a counterclockwise, we call it a vortex, using a name from fluid mechanics. 
It's a vortex of twisting space. It's like you take a towel with water in it and you, you twist the towel in order to remove the water. You have a choice. You can, as seen from your, this hand, you can twist at the bottom clockwise or counterclockwise. As seen from the bottom hand, it's clockwise or counterclockwise. It's the same. And so the twist here of space is counterclockwise, and at the south pole, the twist is clockwise. The twist, uh, the angular velocity then, the difference, difference in the angular velocity between her head and her feet, the angular velocity of the twist, divided by her height, is the normal, normal component of the frame drag field. We call this a horizon vorticity. Physically, it's just the twist at the uh, black hole horizon. We paint the black hole down here blue to tell us this is a clockwise twist, and red up here to tell us this is a counterclockwise twist. The region of large twisting, or high horizon vorticity, we call a horizon vortex. So a spinning black hole has two horizon vortexes. It has a counterclockwise vortex at the north pole and a clockwise vortex at the south pole. I now want to show you a simulation from our, uh, our uh, numerical relativity group of two black holes colliding. This black hole has its clockwise vortex up. This one has its counterclockwise vortex up. up. They're going to collide head on, and, I'm going, and we will see from the simulation how the vorticity evolves. So I'm going to slow it down and walk it through. You see, the first thing that happens is each, the, what you're, I'm showing you is the horizon of the black hole. The point such that if you go through the horizon, you can never get out. The first thing that happens is the two black holes raise tides on each other's horizon. Those tides merge and touch. And the merged black hole now vibrates. You notice the blue vortex is in the upper right. And watch what happens. Just watch the upper right. Lies. You notice it switched to red, then to blue, then to red, then to blue. When these vortexes feel each other's presence, they interact <coughs> and they exchange vorticity. They exchange the direction of twist. So that uh, they're first twisting like that, then they twist like this, then they exchange their twists. This was a big surprise when we saw this. And the consequences outside the black hole are very important. So to describe those consequences, I need to introduce vortex lines. So a vortex lines can be thought of as lines that guide the whirling vortex. What they really are is this is, each vortex line is an integral curve <coughs> of an eigenvector of the frame drag field. The frame drag field is a symmetric trace-free tensor. It therefore has three eigenvectors that are orthogonal to each other. You pick one eigenvector, the one that points out of the black hole in this case, and you just build the integral curves of that eigenvector, like building the integral curves of the magnetic field to get a magnetic field line. This produces a vortex line of twisting space. So each vortex line has a vorticity. The vorticity is the eigenvalue associated with the vortex line. And the physical meaning is that this, if this woman is oriented along a vortex line, once again, the angular velocity of a gyroscope her feet is seen by her head, this omega divided by her height, that is the vorticity, that's the eigenvalue for the frame drag field. 
Uh, we draw uh, blue the vortex lines that are clockwise and red those that are counterclockwise, though my red lines look almost black, but uh, they're supposed to be red. The vortex lines and their vorticities completely characterize the frame drag field. This is half of the uh, of the uh, Raymond tensor, half of the Raymond tensor. Here are the vortex lines for a fast spinning black hole, a curved black hole. Coming out of the north pole of the region, coming out of this uh, horizon vortex, there are counterclockwise vortex lines. They go around the black hole and go back into the north pole the black hole. Coming out of the south pole, out of this clockwise vortex, there are clockwise twisting vortex lines. They go around the black hole and back into the south pole region. And then there is also a family of vortex lines that spirals around and around like this. So there are three families because the uh, frame drag field has three eigenvectors. So there are these three families. But the important thing is that there's very strong vorticity, very strong eigenvalue uh, for the vortex lines that come out of the pole like that and like this. So there's a counterclockwise vortex. We call it a vortex, a, a set of vortex lines of large vorticity. We call a vortex. A twisting space with very strong twist is a vortex. There are two vortexes sticking out of a curved black hole, a clockwise and a counterclockwise vortex. So physically, this vortex is a strong tornado of whirling space, or twisting space. We now understand that <coughs> things that twist rather than the, the whirl. So let me return now to the black hole collision. Now I have these vortexes on the horizon with their vortex lines sticking out of, uh, of twisting space. Uh, and I want to describe what happens to the vortex lines when these black holes collide. So this is the movie. Let me remind you, when the black holes collide, these vortexes re robustly retain their individuality. They remain separate entities. These are physical things that stick out of the merged black hole, just as real as my arms sticking out of my body. There are four of them now. Four of these vortexes of twisting space sticking out of the merged black hole. And I now want to look at how these vortexes behave as the black hole also so here's the black hole oscillating. Here are the vortex lines at a moment when the vorticity on the horizon is strong. So the red vortex line, it's a counterclockwise vortex line, they come out of this red vortex. They go around and go back into the red vortex on the back side of the black hole. The blue vortex uh, Vortex lines come out of the blue, come around, and go back into a blue vortex on the back side of the black hole. But at a moment when the vortexes are changing their direction, there cannot be any vortex lines attached to the black hole. And the black hole is green, no, no vortex lines. So what happens is these vortex lines come off and they reconnect onto each other. And these are movies from our simulations. This is all from our simulations. Uh, and I don't have a movie of this, I just have a snapshot. They reconnect and they form a smoke, something that is very much like a smoke ring. It's a toroidal vortex of twisting space. Uh, and uh, it travels outward at the speed of light. The next oscillation, another vortex is ejected, and soon these vortex lines will jump off and they will reconnect and form a torus of uh, expanding the vorticity. 
There's more than that. I told you there's a second part of the curvature. It's the tidal field. And as these vortexes travel out through an analog of Maxwell's equations, but it's really the so-called beyond the identities of general relativity, the traveling vortexes create a strong tidal field. So we begin only with twisting space, but as the uh, tor toroidal shape uh, vortex travels out, it dynamically creates a stretching and squeezing of the space. And we wind up then with pendex lines, we call them. These are the eigen, these are the integral curves of the eigenvectors of the tidal field. Tendex comes from Latin tendere, which means to stretch. And so there are tendex lines of stretching space that wrap around this torus. So they see this blue person being stretched. There's a red person here being squeezed. Or, I'm sorry, the, the blue one is squeezed. So there's this squeezing tendex around this torus. And along the long direction, there's a stretching tendex line. Stretching tendex line. So the, the structure here, when these, this, and, and these then are gravitational waves. And the structure, when we get far away, is that of a plane gravitational wave on the surface of this torus, where the tendex lines are stretching and squeezing, and then at the same location, the vortex lines are twisting inertial frames. And that is the structure of a gravitational wave in general. In the textbooks, you only learn about the stretch and squeeze. You don't learn about the twist of inertial frames. Nevertheless, in a classic paper that uh, Vladimir Torisovic, uh, 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 Braginsky, uh, wrote many years ago, he described a detector that will work based on the twisting effects. He understood this, but theorists never understood it. Um, so this is how gravitational waves are generated in a head-on collision. We never knew this. This is dynamics, nonlinear dynamics of curved space-time that we have learned from our simulations. More realistic is the two black holes that orbit each other and collide as they spiral together. In this case, the vortexes, the four vortexes attached to the merged black hole, instead of exchanging vorticity, the vortex lines simply sweep out and back like water from a turning sprinkler or like the spiral arms of a galaxy. And as they travel outward uh, at the speed of light, they generate the associated tendex lines and become a gravitational wave. Uh, and here, and if you want to understand how these waves are really generated, it is the vortexes near the black hole in the near zone, inside this yellow circle. It's those vortexes sticking out of the black hole that are generating the waves. These are the sources, the physical sources. Just as my arms, as I turn, generate waves. So these vortexes uh, in the near zone, as they turn around the black hole, they are the source of the gravitational waves. But there's more than that. When the black holes merge, it turns out there is a stretching tendex sticking out of the end of the black hole here, and one there, and a fan-shaped vortex, a tendex that squeezes, sticking out of the uh, equator of the black hole. And as this merged black hole turns, due to the original orbital motion, these tendexes, shown here, they sweep out and back as well. And as they travel, they create associated vortexes, and they create your gravitational waves as two. So there are two families of gravitational waves created, one by the turning vortexes, and one by the turning, these turning tendexes. And that's the entire story. That's everything there is to know about gravitational wave generation. Except for the remark that the meaning of the two types of waves, the waves created by these tendexes, and the waves created by the 
turning vortexes, leading against each other can produce huge radiation reaction. Kicks of the merged black hole as high as 4,000 kilometers per second, which can eject the merged black hole from any the center of any galaxy. To show you how strong these vortexes and tendexes really are, let me show you a simulation by the Cornell part of our team of a neutron star and a black hole. The neutron star is, uh, the black hole is three times heavier than the neutron star. The neutron star is orbiting in this plane. The black hole is spinning around that axis. So the black hole spins like this. The, new, the neutron star orbits like this. In the simulation, you will see two things happen. First, the black hole's tendexes tear the star apart. Second, the black hole's vortexes then throw all the stellar matter, 1.5 solar masses of stellar matter, out of this plane and up into that plane. So you imagine a vortex strong enough to move 1.5 solar masses of nuclear matter into this other plane after the tendexes have torn the star apart. So this is what we see in this simulation. Uh, that's the original orbital plane you see this uh, little uh, network there. So, so I will back it up and do it one more time so I can comment on it. Let me walk it. So here you see the tendexes are now tearing the star apart. Some of the stellar material is going into the black hole. Some of it is now being thrown up. The spidey vortexes it is thrown up into that other plane. And it then travels around and forms an accretion disk around the black hole. From this process, we get gravitational waves, we get gamma rays from the hot nuclear matter, uh, we get neutrinos, and later we get light, radio waves. So this is the foundation for what we call multi-messenger astronomy, studying the universe with all of these different kinds of radiation simultaneously. So let me talk then in my remaining time about the gravitational wave observations. Are there any questions? Yes.
standard of length yes. and if you want to rotate something you have to show that yes. your head is facing the reflector. So if there is nothing internal which would play this role. You need external kind of physical well, I, I, I need to, I, I need well, in order to discuss the stretching, the squeezing and the twisting, you need I need measuring twist. apparatus right. which I generally make out of matter. Sometimes I use Stephen Hawking. Sometimes I use a woman. I'm not a sexist. I switch back and forth. Stephen Hawking, I should explain. Stephen Hawking is a clo very close personal friend, and he has given me permission to twist him and stretch him. But I need a foreign object, a measuring device. Now, there is a little bit of history about this. Uh, I want to translate you to. Uh, a linear and circular polarization. Out of all that, if I see circular and polarized wave from the far away, can we really trace back and say that circular and polarized wave was created here and it is a result of something increasing the pressure? So can you hear the question up there? <laughs> yes. Uh, so yes. If you see circular polarized waves, you see a particular waveform, you can trace it back. Uh, well, let me say, I, I will explain this in a moment, but uh, we are building a catalog to permit us to see a waveform and go back and say what was happening with vortexes and tendexes to produce it. Yes. So I will come to that in just a moment, but let me just remark that gravitational wave observations of black holes will be made in the near future with ground-based interferometers such as LIGO in the band, frequency band from 10 hertz to 10,000 hertz, observing black holes of 2 to 1,000 solar masses. Space-based interferometers such as LISA with frequencies between 10 to the minus 4 and uh, 10 to the minus 1 hertz, at periods of 10 seconds to 3 hours, will observe black holes 10,000 to 10 million solar masses. And a technique of pulsar timing will observe black holes of 100 million to 10 billion solar masses uh, with periods of a month to 30 years. And all of these techniques will succeed in the coming few years. I will focus on the ground-based interferometers, uh, such as LIGO, in which then a gravitational wave with its uh, stretching tendexes and squeezing tendexes impinges, falls on a device with masses, mirrors that hang from overhead supports. The wave stretches these mir mirrors apart. The, uh, the blue tendexes squeeze these together. Then the wave oscillates, and red tendexes stretch this apart, and the blue tendexes squeeze these together. And they, this, is, uh, this stretch and the ch difference in arm length is monitored, measured using laser interferometry. As I remarked in answer to Leonia's uh, uh, question, uh, the, we are building a catalog. And here is an example out of the catalog. Uh, this is from a simulation by the team at Caltech, Cornell, and CETA. We have a black hole of 60 solar masses. Uh, it's spinning at 91% to the fastest possible rate as we say A over M equal 0.91. We have another black hole of 10 solar masses spinning at 0.3 the maximum rate. They're spinning in very, around very different spin axes. This is the direction to Earth, and here are the two waveforms associated with the two polarizations. 
carrying out the Caltech Cornell uh, Canada group, 1,000 simulations with different directions of spins, magnitudes of spins, uh, sizes of black holes, in order to build a dictionary to be used in analyzing the LIGO data to interpret what we see. 130 of these simulations are now finished. So we are uh, in the process. Over the last one year, we've done 130. We expect to do another 100 by the end of this year. And, uh, uh, a 1,000 before a live advanced LIGO is uh, at design sensitivity. Uh, just for some numbers to remind you that uh, the uh, strength of the waves is such that these mirrors will be pushed back and forth with an arm length separation of four kilometers by about four one thousandth of a fermion, four times 10 to the minus 16 centimeters, which is a very small number. And the technology to do this is very impressive. Uh, there is a network of ground-based interferometers operating in the high-frequency band that includes interferometers in Hanford, Washington, Livingston, Louisiana. Uh, there is uh, in Hanover, Germany, Pisa, uh, Italy. There is one now under construction in Japan, and we are planning to move one of our three LIGO detectors to India. So we will have a worldwide network. The network at present is the, this set of sites. Japan and India are new and should be in operation by the end of this decade. We need this network in order to be confident that what we see is truly a gravitational wave, in order to extract the waveforms, in order to determine the direction to the source by the time delay and arrival of the signal at these many different interferometers. LIGO is a collaboration now of about 850 scientists at 75 institutions in 13 nations. Uh, the, uh, Russia is a major contributor, as uh, I will comment on as we go along through this. Uh, here's the Hanford, Washington. Livingston, Louisiana. This is an advanced development detector, not a full detector, but one for developing technology in Germany. Uh, my colleagues and I proposed to build LIGO in 1989. We said we would do this in two steps. We would build initial interferometers with a sensitivity where it's plausible but not likely to see waves. Then advanced interferometers that are more sensitive so that it is likely to see waves from many sources. We had to do this in two steps because the uh, technology is so difficult. It was necessary to get experience with the initial interferometer before building the much more complex advanced interferometer. The initial interferometers operated between 2005 and 2010. They were able to see black holes colliding out to 300 million light years, 100 megaparsecs. Nothing has been seen yet, but we have uh, placed very interesting limits on the number. We began installing the advanced interferometers in 2010, about two, a, year, a little less than two years ago. We, it would, the insulation will require through the end of 2013, basically three and a half years to install. And then about three years uh, uh, to commission, that is to bring them toward design sensitivity. We should be near design sensitivity in 2017. These will see black hole binaries out to four billion light years, a cosmological redshift. 0.2, where the event rate is expected to be between three per day and one every two years, and many other sources. This just shows you this uh, curve, this solid curve, is the noise curve we said we would achieve when we wrote our proposal in 1989. These 
these are the actual noise curves in, uh, in yellow and in red, which looks black here, uh, that were achieved as of 2007. So the design was achieved, the design sensitivity was achieved everywhere except in this very small region at low frequencies. Notice this frequency is 10 hertz, 10,000 hertz. These is the square root of the spectral density of noise, 10 to the minus 23 here, the, the lowest point. You multiply by square root of the uh, frequency for a uh, for a noise in a bandwidth equal to frequency. So square root of 100 is 10. And so the RMS noise in a bandwidth equal to frequency here is about uh, 3 times 10 to the minus 22. Very, very impressive. Uh, as I said, we did a search 2005 to 2007, saw nothing. Uh, we then, under the leadership of a new assistant professor at Caltech, Rana Adhikari, the uh, detectors were improved by another factor of approximately two at high frequencies, and we did a second search, and the data are now being analyzed. Here is the noise curve for the advanced detectors, which are now being installed. Uh, going from the initial detectors to the advanced detectors, is a very big step technologically. Instead of hanging the 11 kilogram mirror by a steel wire, in advanced LIGO we hang a 40 kilogram mirror by a fused silica fiber, a suspension system that was invented and perfected here in Professor Braginsky's group at Moscow State University. By a fused silica fiber which hangs from a mass, which hangs from a mass, which hangs from a mass, which hangs from an overhead support. Much more complex system in order to reduce the noise. Uh, a major question is that excess noise, this fiber, this fiber is stretched almost to its breaking point. And occasionally it will suddenly jerk, suddenly move. We don't know why, we don't understand why. It's necessary to understand how often this happens, what are the characteristics of these, in order to remove this from the data. And that research is focused here at Moscow State University uh, with uh, uh, Valery Mitrofanov and uh, Perkinsky's group uh, playing a, uh, one of the leading roles here. A number of people here are contributing. In the initial LIGO, we have a uh, light beam between these two mirrors of 10 kilowatts. These mirrors form a fabric for old cavity that is excited in a mode with approximately 10 to the 9 nodes in the mode. Imagine a giant fabric for old cavity, 4 kilometers long, with 10 kilowatts of power circulating between the mirrors. In advanced LIGO, this will be one megawatt, approximately. It's a very high power. And it is, again, uh, Brzezinski's group that is focused on the serious issues you must confront and deal with when you operate at these very high powers. Uh, initial LIGO has uh, a uh, configuration of mirrors that looks like this. In advanced LIGO, we add one more mirror that takes an outcoming signal going to a photo detector, and we send the signal back in, a portion of the signal back in, which enables us to change the shape of the noise curve in whatever way we want, which is crucial for going after specific sources. And we have an active vibration isolation. One more key new thing in advanced LIGO, we now must monitor the motions of 40 kilogram mirrors to a precision that is approximately the half width of the Schrodinger wave function of the center of mass degree of freedom. For the first time, we will see a human-sized object, 40 kilogram object, 
behave quantum mechanically. It was uh, Professor Braginsky who first told us we have problems here. We have to completely think in new ways about uh, detectors that operate in this regime. He invented the phrase quantum non-demolition technology to deal with this. And uh, his group has been the leading group in the world in uh, the conceptual development of the techniques for quantum non-demolition. I'm proud that my group has collaborated for many years with your group uh, in, in this work. Uh, there are many different sources of gravitational waves. We will see with advanced LIGO. The hour is late. I will not discuss them. But the black hole mergers are just one. They're the ones that are most interesting to me. But there are many others. So let me just conclude by saying that highly dynamical black holes, the nonlinear dynamics of curved space time, when the black holes collide, show an amazing richness of their structure and their behavior. Numerical relativity is a powerful tool to study this richness. Gravitational waves will bring this rich physics to the realm of observation. And as a result, a new golden <coughs> age for black hole research uh, is coming upon us. And I expect an entire revolution in our understanding of the universe from studying this and many other types of objects in the universe with gravitational waves. Thank you.
so here we are, as, except for those delays due to George W. Bush and about two years longer commissioning. Here we are, about where we expect it to be now. So this is 2017. You expect five years. That's that, that's my estimate. We'll wait. We'll wait. What will be your reaction if uh, the first detection of gravitational waves come uh, from other detectors, for example, pulse observation? So, so I, I think that the uh, that the people who do pulsar timing have a good possibility to see waves before we do, and that will be wonderful. Our goal is not to make the first detection. Our goal is to learn about the universe observationally and learn about nonlinear dynamics of curved space time. The pulsar timing, which I am quite sure will have success on approximately the same time frame as we do, uh, that operates at a basic uh, uh, period, gravitational wave period, best sensitivity probably a period about one year. So the number of bits that can be collected in a human lifetime is not many. We operate uh, at, with a basic period of about 10 milliseconds for our best sensitivity. So the number of bits in a human lifetime is very large. So the uh, that's why uh, in terms of learning about the universe, learning about uh, gravity, space-time curvature, I think these ground-based interferometers are the things that will bring us a huge, a large amount of knowledge. Whereas the uh, pulsar timing may succeed first, it will be very interesting in what it tells us, but quite limited in uh, the number of bits of information it brings. Thank you. Could you say what are perspectives for search of radiation waves from uh, binary engineering emerging groups? Uh, yeah. So perspectives for search of radiation waves from uh, close binary engineering groups. What kind of like one, for example, I So So uh, the LIGO's frequency band, the high frequency band, uh, is the best frequency band for black holes that are made from stellar mass stars. For black hole neutron star binaries. For neutron star neutron star binaries. But for degenerate white dwarf systems, uh, as uh, Professor Tudikov uh, asks about, and to which he has contributed so much, uh, you have to operate in the LISA, or so-called low frequency band, where you're with gravitational wave periods of 10 minutes to hours. And that requires a space-based interferometer, such as the LISA interferometer. LISA was a joint mission between NASA and the United States and ESA, the European Space Agency, uh, until recently. Recently, the ESA said to NASA, you cannot possibly do what you promised to do because you don't have enough money because of the cost of the new James Webb Space Telescope. And pardon? So, to machine. Yeah, and, and so, so Lisa, with the design we had, had basically two detectors in a triangle. Um, and so it could do what we wanted. Uh, but uh, uh, NASA uh, left the mission. They said, yes, you're right. And so it, this is now an entirely a Lisa, a European mission. The Europeans are beginning to talk to China about uh, uh, becoming a partner. Uh, was, was the first one. Pardon? Uh, but, but was, was the first one. Yes, but it was, the big issue is money. The big issue is money. Well, in some sense, the bigger issue is
confidence of technology. Uh, this, this is very difficult technology. There is a mission called Pathfinder mission to test much of this technology in space, which will be launched in 2014. There is, since there were problems with the Gravity Pole B mission, uh, NASA and ESA have been even more frightened of the, te the technology in, in Lisa. So there have been two studies in, the, in recent years, one in Europe and one in the US, competing LISA gravity wave mission against all other mission, big missions. In both studies, LISA was ranked at the top, number one for the science. But because of fear about the technology, it was pushed down to a lower ranking, and it has not moved forward. So only after the Pathfinder mission flies, uh, if it is successful, only then will NISA or NASA make a serious commitment. Uh, if it fails, then we may be delayed uh, with space-based missions for another decade, uh, I, I fear. So the crucial thing is the Pathfinder mission in 2014, after which, if it's successful, I am confident NISA will make a strong commitment. And, uh, but whether NASA can return to the mission, this depends on uh, finances and management at, at NASA. NASA has not been managed well. It has been badly mismanaged, in my view, over the last uh, uh, 10 years, uh, 15 years. Uh, and, uh, and so there are two issues in NASA, it's management, uh, and, uh, and money. Please. Um, if I don't understand exactly, what does it mean last two years operating of LIGO for the astrophysics? Because you don't detect any uh, gravitational wave events, but we listen to this result science to weather experience. Can you formulate your results of the two or three last years in terms of the astrophysical? For example, in such volume, the collision or measured platform for winter stars is smaller than. Yeah, and uh, another question may be first, what is the real observation of time, instead of observation of time, on LIGO, on the uh, upper sensitivity. What, how many hours uh, okay, you so, have that? Okay, let, I'll answer the second question first. The duty cycle uh, to, if for LIGO and Virgo uh, to have at least three interferometers uh, operating at, uh, at, at close to their my best sensitivity uh, was about, in my memory is about 60% of the time, and two interferometers about 80% of the time. So it's a, a large fraction of the time, but not 100%. Uh, the first question, so I don't, I don't have that, I can search for a slide on this, but I don't have it in, in here. Let me just quote from memory. So we can say that in the LIGO frequency band, that the uh, amount of, uh, of energy in the universe in gravitational waves is less than approximately three parts in a million of the closure density, three times 10 to the minus seven. Uh, we can say that the Crab pulsar, its emission, its emission of gravitational waves and therefore slowdown due to gravitational waves is less than 8%, is the most recent number I remember, of that being emitted in electromagnetic waves. Uh, we can say that the frequency of mergers of neutron stars uh, is uh, uh, less than, and again, I, I don't remember the precise number, but something like uh, one in a thousand years in a galaxy. 
galaxy like our own. So these are the kinds of numbers that we have. There have been a large number of publications. There are specific uh, gallery bursts uh, that have been seen for which there is no associated uh, 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 gravitational waves. And uh, 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 two of these... Well, just a moment. Two of these were associated with nearby galaxies in terms of location. And uh, so what we could conclude is either these are soft, rather strong soft gamma repeaters in those nearby galaxies or, or they're very far away. So th this is the flavor of, of the uh, results so far. There are a large number of uh, publications. Um, perhaps I should describe one example that gives you some sense of what's going on. Uh, there was, there is a committee of about three people in the LIGO Virgo collaboration who have the responsibility to uh, apply forces, electric, uh, magnetic forces, to all of the world's gravitational wave interferometers, pushing the mirrors back and forth in just a, such a way that corresponds to a particular source on the sky. They, uh, they choose the source, uh, they, uh, uh, and they apply these forces to, to the three LIGO interferometers, the Virgo interferometer, the uh, Hanford, uh, uh, the uh, Geo interferometer in Hanover. And so when, if the uh, LIGO Virgo team sees a gravitational wave, the team does not know whether it's a truly a wave or whether it was something injected by moving mirrors by this group of three people. So such a wave, uh, a, a fairly strong wave was discovered by the team. Uh, can uh, somebody remember when it was? It was about uh, two years ago last August, if my memory is wrong. And I was in Hanover at that time, and I was February. Yeah. But yeah. well, anyway, so a, a source was seen, the data were analyzed, it was found to be two black holes uh, spiraling together. Uh, the masses and the spins of the black holes were measured. A, uh, there was a great internal debate. Is this a real signal? Is it not? Uh, there were committees formed to study the data. Uh, a paper was written describing the first discovery of gravitational waves. And only after this, the team was assembled and uh, uh, the uh, paper was presented for people to agree we should submit it if this signal is real. And then the committee of three people was asked, did you make that or did nature make that? And unfortunately, it was made by these three people. But it was a test of the entire system, uh, from the motion of the mirrors through the, uh, the readout system, and the data analysis, and the debate within the team, uh, all the way through, uh, public, through the writing of the paper. That paper, I think, is now available on the web. Uh, it, uh, with an explanation that this was not a real source. But this is uh, the kind of internal testing that this team has gone through. I think it's getting late. Maybe. Look at the 
beyond the identities, which are uh, equations uh, about derivatives of the Riemann curvature tensor. The first, uh, it involved the first derivative of the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, in the same sense as the Maxwell equations involve first derivatives of the electromagnetic field tensor. If you look at these Bianchi identities and express them in terms of the tidal field and the frame drag field in a local inertial frame, they're essentially identical to Maxwell's equations. It's quite remarkable. Uh, aside from the question of symmetrizing uh, and removing a trace at, at, at crucial stages, it's just like Maxwell's equations. So our intuition from Maxwell's equations can be carried over. Uh, and in the case of gravitational waves produced by a rotating vortexes, uh, they, the vortexes generate the tendex lines or the tidal field by the same induction equations, Faraday induction equations, as you have uh, in Maxwell's theory. Um, so references on this are in our physical re review letter from last year. Uh, we don't have details there. But this is something that has uh, been known uh, to mathematical physicists for many years. But uh, strangely, this has not played a very important role in uh, relativity until now. I think now we are finding it extremely useful in understanding uh, the things that I described to you. Thank you so much.